Hello, everyone. I'm Erica Serino, Communications Manager for Plastic Pollution Coalition. Thanks for joining this month's webinar, part of our global series, bringing our community together to highlight the latest issues, information, and resources to help stop the planetary plastic pollution crisis. Welcome to our July webinar, The Challenges and Opportunities of Making Your Business Plastic Free. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a nonprofit communications and advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global alliance of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. We're going to have five poll questions um, that will ask you to get a sense of who's joining us today. And each poll will only appear for about 20 seconds, so please try to answer as quickly as you can. So where are you joining us from today? We're seeing some people in Europe. Hello, North Asia and Asia as well. Thanks for joining. Um, Central and South America, all over the world. That's pretty exciting. What best describes the sector in which you work? So yeah, we have a lot of nonprofits here tonight um, and, but also members of business. And I'm so happy that you could join us um, and hopefully either share your experiences um, or learn from others uh, in this space. So thanks for being here. Number three, are you a business owner? We have some no's and some yeses, um, mostly no's. <laughs> so maybe you might work, be working in a, um, a business that is seeking to go plastic free, or you might be curious about it, or maybe you know, if you're working for a nonprofit, you'd be interested in this. Um, but yeah, overwhelmingly, no. <laughs> Where are you in your zero waste journey? We'd like to know. I think, yeah, I do my best, but I'm not perfect. That's a pretty honest answer. Maybe not sure where to start. Okay. Hopefully we can provide some information on that. Um, and ooh, almost completely zero waste. Very cool. And the last question, how can we help you on your plastic free journey? And you can select multiple. So there are a lot of different ways that hopefully we can help. Great. Excellent. Well, thanks all for participating in these polls. And we wanna thank our webinar sponsor, Pangea Organics um, for sponsoring today's webinar. Pangea is a prestige collection of skin and body care products, truly sustainable from soil to skin. Their formulas are plant-based, vegan, and cruelty-free. Check them out on, on pangeaorganics.com. In 2006, Pangea partnered with design and innovation company IDEO to launch the first planetary beauty product packaging made from 100% post-consumer molded fiber. Pangea last year completely eliminated plastics from its packaging, instead using infinitely recyclable aluminum. And thirdly, Pangea works with a network of ethical organic farmers to source ingredients for its skincare and beauty products. To learn more about Pangea Organics, visit pangeaorganics.com again. Thank you. All right, so today we're excited to have Alejandra Warren, co-founder and executive director at Plastic Free Future, Cassia Patel, director of programs at Oceanic Global, and Joshua Onescio, founder of and CEO of Pangea Organics. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's panelists, beginning with Alejandra Warren. Alejandra is an intersectional environmentalist working on diverse plastic reduction, resource conservation, and intersectional justice projects in California. She co-founded Plastic Free Future in 2020, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the reduction and elimination of plastic pollution through promoting reusable alternatives and focusing on outreach to syst systemically excluded communities. From soil to humans, Alejandra strongly believes in the interconnectedness of all organisms that are working to heal our relationship with the environment and will lead to happier, healthier, and more resilient communities. Welcome, Alejandra. Hi, Erica. Thank you so much for having us here today. Again, like Erica said, I am the co-founder of Plastic Free Future. We are a nonprofit organization located in California. We do a lot of work with Latinx communities and with systemically excluded communities. 
we know that removing plastic from our lives must be a priority. It is an urgent priority. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the news. The planet is literally on fire and plastics are only fossil fuels. So we're not talking about a transition to trendy brands, to cleaner, sustainable options. We're talking about something that is so urgent for all of you business owners we need to make this happen as soon as possible. It is an issue that individuals have to contribute to, businesses, corporations, government. This is an all hands on deck situation and we really have to make it happen as soon as possible. Restaurants, businesses, it should be our commitment to our commitment to switch to alternatives that have less plastic but are also that also that are reusable and refillable alternatives. I really want to make emphasis on that. It is important that we transition to that because um, Every single item that is single use has problems, um, especially when we're talking about um, trees for paper and also for all, uh, metals that are coming mostly from South America, where I am from. So there are a lot of impacts from every single material, but the worst, the, to the most toxic and our enemy number one is plastic. And that's why we're here to support you and support your business and your brand. Uh, we're here to answer questions and we're happy to to be part of that process to do the right thing as a business. Thank you, Erika. Thank you, Alejandra. Next, I'd like to introduce Cassia Patel. Cassia is a sustainability thought leader and author dedicated to driving scalable behavior change and building community resilience. As the director of programs for the international nonprofit Oceanic Global, Cassia has designed and led initiatives that catalyze conservation, implement systems for lasting change, build coalition-led efforts and impact policy, including the Global Plastics Treaty. Cassia has formal training as an environmental engineer, underwater research ecologist, and in sustainable design as an accredited LEED GA, well AP and reset AP. Welcome, Cassia. Thank you, Erica, and thank you for the, the warm introduction. It's lovely to be here with all of you talking about this really important, um, this really important topic to really engage all sectors, especially those in the private sector in this movement, as Alejandra passionately shared with us. Um, my name is Cassia, I'm the Director of Programs at Oceanic Global. We are an ocean conservation nonprofit focused on driving scalable behavior change. So we work at the individual and the community level. We have volunteer chapters around the world to really empower locally led action, uh, regional action that includes education, driving policy, engaging with businesses. Uh, we also do specifically focus on engaging with businesses, envisioning that the choices we make as an individual can scale as we think about the choices a company, a restaurant, a hotel, a multinational company make. Um, and companies are made out of people, people who make decisions as well. And so giving people the best tools as possible um, to make informed decisions. And policy does fit into all of this because policy can push businesses to make those choices, push solution providers um, like Joshua and others to, to provide those alternatives, to create a demand for that and to make those alternatives more readily available, cheaper, accessible, um, uh, you know, to guide that transition as well. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, I, I mentioned that we work at the individual community and business level. At the business level, we have a program called the Blue Standard. And this is really designed to empower businesses to make the best choices for our planet. And we really start by tackling single-use plastics and improving waste management. So eliminating single-use plastics um, in hospitality, restaurants, hotels, and the tourism sector. Um, we work with the music industry, tours, concerts, venues. We work with events, whether that's conferences, um, best festivals or community events, um, office spaces, sports stadiums, and consumer brands um, as mentioned here too. So guiding, we have free resources on our website to help businesses make those choices to understand that hierarchy of best practice as Alejandra noted, really shifting towards reuse as much as possible um, and where not possible at the moment or um, in, in different situations, finding what is that best, best next alternative? How do you weigh those options? And what does it actually look like to implement that, to train your team, to make that shift. And I know we'll talk more about that later in the conversation today, but actually creating a ripple effect of change, not just within your own business, but within all of the vendors, suppliers that you work with as well, and asking questions that may push them to change and then offer those solutions to other clients in their network as well. Um, I think there's one more slide here. 
to just share a little bit more. So through Blue, I mentioned that we, we offer the support and these resources. We also do have a verification system. So we can recognize businesses with one, two, or three stars. Three star is our highest level recognition. That's for a business that is fully eliminated single use plastic. So they get that plastic free ribbon. Um, and this is to really incentivize businesses to make that shift and, and to be able to communicate that in an authentic and accountable way. Uh, and we do train consultants around the world to be able to, to lead this work um, and engage businesses in their region as well. It's quite modular, as you can see, looking at types of plastic items to eliminate. Um, we also do include blue action. So I mentioned we go beyond plastic and waste, and that includes thinking about food sourcing, especially responsible seafood, waste water management, energy sourcing, um, sorry, energy production and other aspects of operations. But plastic and waste has been really core to our journey and, and where this program starts. Um, and there's one final slide that just shares uh, the equivalent for the consumer goods industry. So we have two tiers of verification here, one for products. And so that's the physical product as well as the packaging. Um, it's quite explicitly plastic free. So that's not just single use plastic, but all forms of plastic. Um, and there's two tiers there relating to the product and then also just to the packaging. And that's for items like electronics and others where there are necessary elements of plastic in the product itself, uh, but to be able to recognize the, the packaging and, and shipping, transportation, distribution um, that goes alongside it, that the company has agency over. So um, yeah, just a little bit more about the work that we do and excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Cassia. Last but certainly, certainly not least, it's my great pleasure to introduce Joshua Inesco. Uh, Joshua is the award-winning entrepreneur, founder, and CEO of Pangea Brands. And for over 20 years, he has been he has led Pangea in developing sustainable plant-based body and skincare products, culminating in the latest product launches in 2021 featuring plastic-free packaging. Pangea's formulas combine powerful bioactive ingredients from nature with the power of science for products that are highly efficacious and nourishing. Joshua has traveled to over 50 regions worldwide to find and cultivate deep relationships with organic farmers who themselves are committed to five-star care for the people and the environments that produce their products. Joshua is on a deep-rooted mission to provide consumers a choice to purchase their favorite products without plastic and hopes to continue to inspire change for others to follow suit within the beauty industry. So thanks again, Joshua. Hey everybody, I'm really excited to be here today. And um, I have been in the beauty industry for 22 years. And it's always been our mission to source all of our ingredients sustainably from regenerative farms whenever possible, and also to lead on the edge of sustainable design when it comes to our packaging. And about five years ago, I set out to take our two brands, Alpine Provisions and Pangea Organics Plastic Free. And the journey ended up taking about three years. And we are very proud to say that both Pangea and Alpine Provisions are both plastic free brands. And I'm excited to be on this panel because there's a lot that goes into it and there's a lot of decisions that need to be made on which materials are best and which materials are better and where they're coming from is almost just as important as what they're made from. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of this panel for those of you who are more interested in the nitty gritty of uh, design and material choices or if you own a brand that is also trying to go plastic free I am here to help as much as I can. So we'll be a little, talking a little bit about these uh, materials. The, the peptide toner is glass with an aluminum cap, and all of our glass is also being protected by a really interesting molded fiber. You might recognize this from a lot of the technology that you've been buying. It protects the glass which is what allows us to use glass during shipping. And on the right is an aluminum tube. And one of the things that took the most amount of time to use aluminum tubes is that cap that you see at the bottom. So that is a cap that we worked internally to design. And it's a cap that completely replaces all plastic caps. And we were also able to replace, replace the plastic threads that are normally on aluminum tubes with uh, with aluminum threads. So that entire package is 100% recyclable. And this is Alpine Provisions. So all of our products come with an aluminum cap like you see on the right-hand bottle. And the idea is that the pumps 
and sprayers, which are needed for all products, are designed to be able to use for 10 years. So one of the first things we tackled is that anything with a moving part, like a pump or a sprayer, is not recyclable at all. And it's not even downcyclable, it's just landfill. But if you design it properly, these pumps and sprayers can be used up to a decade. So whenever you buy a new product, whether it's Pangea or Alpine, it comes with aluminum cap. You can obviously choose to omit buying a pump or a spray at all, or you can simply take it out of the um, used bottle and put it into the new bottle. And we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> and we created a nonprofit called Life After Plastic which is a free to use open source symbol that just signifies to consumers that the packaging is 100% plastic free. And anybody that's interested in using that symbol uh, can contact me offline. Uh, this is talking a, a lot about the uh, sustainability that goes into the manufacturing of each and every product. So for example, this molded fiber uh, is innovative because of the low impact during the manufacturing process. It's actually made of 100% post-consumer fibers and is does not come from virgin trees, obviously. And it's a better protector than the boxes that we use for things like our aluminum tubes. Thank you, Joshua. And I wanna take a moment to recognize your achievements creating a plastic-free business. And now we will begin our Q&A so we can talk to our amazing panelists about um, some of our you know, plastic-free business predicaments, um, questions about what types of packaging to use, et cetera. I've seen a lot of great questions come in. So please feel free to populate the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So start with this question. Um, we are, if you are already a plastic, sorry, we're starting from the perspective of someone who's already a plastics free business. So you're already a plastics free business and what strategies can we use to encourage our vendors and suppliers to become plastic free? There's, um, I mean, once we got over this three year hump of designing our own products, we started working with, for example, our third party logistics company that ships all of our products, um, was able to switch over to 100% plastic free tapes which, you know, if you've ever seen uh, a shipping warehouse, you'll see the amount of shrink wrap and tape that goes into shipping and logistics. And it's absolutely obscene. But I truly believe once people start seeing it on the boxes that show up to their house and see that there's better options, they can start asking their shipping companies to change. And one of the things that I've been looking into is there's two great companies that are replacing shrink wrap which is how pallets are shipped all over the world. They're reusable uh, mesh wraps that actually bungee cord around pallets and are actually less expensive to use than single than single use plastic. And it's going to take a lot of companies to start using these because it's a one way product. So if we're shipping a pallet from California to our 3PL in Connecticut, we need to then use that same product to ship something somewhere else. And so it's one of the gr great reasons why a lot of companies need to come together to make better decisions for the entire logistics platform. Yeah, absolutely. I love hearing about that, that alternative though. Um, that's super exciting. And, and like you said, Joshua, too, just thinking about economies of scale and these these global systems that are challenging to impact as a single company um, when we do work with uh, large consumer consumer brands that is one of the exciting opportunities is being able to shift you know for for folks that do have a large market share um, whether it's packaging or beverage and um, we work really closely with corona usa for example and constellation brands who have been taking deep initiatives to eliminate single-use plastics throughout their operations supply chain packaging um, and what's been exciting is to also work with their different cross-functional teams, whether it's merchandising and the third-party agency they work with there, whether it's trade marketing and the third-party agency there and sports partnerships and the products that they're creating within that vein. Um, and to also 
see how there's so much excitement and interest from the individuals who are within those different teams who are then those third party agencies are then taking that to their other clients or being able to once we solve once we're able to find a solution for something or, or, or solve, for example, um, you, you mentioned shipping in the shrink wrap solution. If those shipping companies can then offer that to other companies that may have similar CSR goals, similar plastic reduction pressure from their um, consumers, from their investors uh, and not know how quite to get there. Um, by seeing that example, they're able to take that on too. So I think that's part of the, the question I think was how do you engage vendors and suppliers? And I think the first question is just to simply ask what are those alternatives and, and to keep on um, sharing that it's a, not only a desire, but also a requirement um, for your business and, and to be able to point to external frameworks that are pushing you that direction can always be helpful to say, okay, well, this is our company's goal. It's not up to me. Like I have to, I have to meet this, this goal. And this is what we have to do. Um, then you people are, are able to think through, through that in, in those terms as a deliverable as well. And that can be supportive, but yeah. I, I was going to say exactly what Cassie is saying right now. You have to set the standards because if we all give up and we say, well, there's no solution right now, that's why we need innovation. That's why we need every single brain, diverse brain trying to work on these alternatives. Anyone working in food uh, distributions, I, I did food distributions for a while and I know that every single palette comes wrapped in that. So if you're work, doing any work related to palettes, you don't know what problems you're going to be solving. Maybe it is complicated. Maybe you have to invest a little bit more. Maybe you have to go out of the way, but you might be paving the way for those companies that are clueless and they don't have the option to invest in innovation and you're going to be making life easier for them too. Mm. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I like to say the fringe predicts the future. And I think it's really important for people that are listening because this is the fringe that it's really important to, to go out and seek all the brands that are checking all your boxes. And, you know, on social media, I see a lot of people talking about, you know, how bad this corporation is or how, how bad that corporation is. Forget about them. Talk about the brands that you buy and the small brands that are making better decisions for a plastic free future, because those larger corporations, as they start to see their business being pulled away, they're going to change. They're generally not going to change because all of a sudden they want to have a plastic free future. They're going to change because they need to keep their numbers up. And the way to do that is to be supporting brands that are choosing the right things when it comes to organic, sustainable packaging, plastic free ingredient sourcing, shipping, logistics, and on and on and on. And I always recommend to people when they're on this journey, pick one product a week. You know, like three weeks ago, my, my journey was paper towels. <laughs> and I finally found a company making 100% post-consumer paper towels that come in a box that use no tape and there's no plastic in the entire process. And if you just choose one product a week, by the end of the year, you're pretty much set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is only thanks to that people being able to pay one, two, three extra dollars that we're going to normalize this process. Otherwise, low-income communities are never going to be able to afford these brands. So um, it's up to us being able to pay the extra dollar to do it. Uh, I got something here that I would love to show everyone. Um, I am really... I'm a terrible consumer. I don't buy a lot of stuff. I, I'm really mindful of what I buy. So if I buy something, it's because I really love it. You mean and, you're a great um, consumer? <laughs> yeah, I found, <laughs> I found the, this mascara and it comes in this uh, reusable, I don't want to show the brand, but it comes in this reusable pouch. So you just send the mascara back, they sterilize the stainless steel, they refill it and wow. they send it back. So it's the same okay. container. It, it says that it's been used thousands of times already, this container. So mm -hmm. if you spend that extra dollar in supporting a brand, like uh, Joshua was saying, that is going out of the way to get us to the point where we can have more options, this is going to have benefits in communities that would never, ever, ever be able to afford them if we don't normalize them, just like happened with organic, just like it, it happens with everything. We have to support it first so it would become cheaper and more uh, affordable for those communities that really need it. Mm -hmm. I agree more. Thanks for all of your insights. That was really fascinating. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in and there are many about um, you know, both large and small businesses. But I think Alejandra, how are you working with small mom and pop businesses to assist in the transition to reusable systems 
or non-plastic packaging while protecting their bottom lines. So to keep in that. Yeah, mind. sure. Uh, a lot of the work we do is uh, we try to do it mindfully in a very inclusive way. So our focus in, is in those communities that usually are the last ones transitioning. Um, I do a lot of work in a little city in California. It's called East Palo Alto. It's about 90% Latinx, and they're still loaded with styrofoam. And this is a community that is only 30 minutes from San Francisco. San Francisco has very strict rules, especially Marine has better rules, even Pacifica has better rules, uh, asking for reusables for restaurants. But imagine 30 minutes from San Francisco is a community that is loaded with styrofoam. We're not even talking about plastic, number four, number five, number six, we're talking about the lowest, more, more toxic plastic. So when we bring these communities that don't have the option to transition and we have the conversations with them, in this case, with restaurants and with small businesses and show them it is possible. Actually, I'm gonna show you something. Part of our project that we did yesterday is we're collecting jars from the community and we're bringing them to those Latinx businesses so they can be a zero waste store. So here are my hot peppers. <laughs> and then we sterilize the jars and bring them again and again and again, because if we don't support these small businesses, it's really hard for them to afford the changes. Thank you so much, Alejandra. And a few people are asking for that mascara brand. <laughs> I don't know if we should be doing branding, but I'm sure if we put it in the chat or whatnot, that would be fine. Um, you let me know. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think there are a lot of people asking um, the question of uh, Joshua, how did you make your business plastic free in the sense of what were the cost implications and what were some of the differences in that um, comparison of those different materials that you had versus plastic? So Alpine um, had a little more constraints. This entire brand, every product is under $20, which is a low threshold because we only use organic ingredients and plastic free and to be under $20 is very difficult. Um, but a lot of it is finding great partners for our ingredients and finding great partners for our aluminum. And, you know, one of the challenges is that the vast majority of aluminum glass is actually coming from countries that don't have a lot of environmental controls. And we really wanted to source our aluminum and glass from places that had strong environmental uh, standards in their manufacturing processes. And so, you know, it took, like I said, it took three years. It was not an easy journey and we were gifted with a pandemic to do it in the middle of, um, but it comes down to first, you have to find the materials that are part of your pellet. So for us, it was molded fiber, glass, and aluminum. And then you have to work with your co-packers because like most brands, we don't own our own facilities. And I really had to partner deep with our manufacturers to buy for, you know, for example, an aluminum tube filling machine, because, you know, after 1988, when all the aluminum toothpaste tubes went away, most manufacturers got rid of their aluminum tube machines, which can cost up to a half a million dollars a piece. And so again, it's going back to what Alejandro was saying is, we have to focus on supporting these small brands that are making these big moves so that this becomes more common. I'm hoping in 10 years, every cosmetic co-packer and food manufacturer in the country has an aluminum tube filling machine because we shouldn't even be using plastic tubes anymore. And in fact, uh, a good point is once you get up to volume, aluminum tubes can be less expensive than plastic tubes and they can be fully recyclable infinitely. And <clears throat> when it came time for the products that we we're putting in glass and I'll open up this package, you know, we had to figure out a way to ship it. So we were actually able to partner with this really beautiful aluminum or a molded fiber company to be able to offer our, some of our products in glass. And obviously Pangea is a luxury line. So we had a lot more bandwidth as far as uh, material choices than Alpine. But, you know, the deodorants that we launched uh, are in paper push-up tubes, which we're definitely not the first company in the world to be using these, but we are the first company to have a fully organic, sustainable formula inside a paper tube. And we just launched our oral care line and had to go through an entire process of, you know, all the way down to what are the bristles on the toothbrush made out of. And our bristles are actually made of 
castor bean oil, which makes the entire toothbrush, which is wooden uh, compostable and our dental floss and tooth tablets versus toothpaste. And I think a lot of times from the outside looking in, you know, for years, people would say, well, just switch over to aluminum bottles and that's it. But there's an entire world that goes behind that. Like, how is it being shipped so they don't get dented? And are your retailers and your shipping facilities able to process these? And can you put these in the same line that your plastic bottles were being filled in? And a lot of the times the answer is no. So that's why things can take so long to do it the right way. Thank you so much for your experience. Um, we have a lot of other questions relating to like packaging and materials. So um, this question got upvoted a lot. Is there a disincentive for packaging manufacturers to make reusable packaging? Because if businesses are reusing it, they're buying less of it. And if so, what is a good approach to overcoming that? And then I'll open that up to everyone uh, on the floor. Yeah, I don't think people buy less. I think people get excited and buy more. If they're buying one soap, they would say, okay, if this soap is so awesome, what if they have softener? Or if what, what if they have dish soap? What else can they make? And this gets companies excited about being more um, open to exploring these alternatives. Um, when, when you see that the customer is responding, the company is going to respond. And we're only going to get more brands, more flavors, more colors, more of everything. So I don't think it's less consumption. I think it's better consumption. And, I and there's, some, there's some, sorry, Cassie, you go ahead. Go for it. No, go for it. Uh, I was going to say, like one of one of the things, kind of that's tailored onto that question is, you know, when we decided to not sell our products with a pump, you know, a lot of retailers didn't really understand how to merchandise this, and there's an entire learning process because we have customers getting the bottle and saying, how do you get the conditioner out of the bottle? And you can actually get it out by shaking it really hard, but you know, it's a new way of thinking. And honestly, one of the first steps in my industry that I would like to see every brand take is nothing should be sold with a pump or a sprayer. There's no reason for it because a lot of times you don't need it and it's completely unrecyclable. It's not even that it's plastic. It's single use plastic that can't even be recycled. And I'd like to see at minimum, the entire industry move away from selling a pump or a sprayer with every single bottle on the shelf. I love that. Yeah, very direct call to action as well. Um, I was just gonna jump in to say that thinking about, um, yeah, there, there's so many stakeholders um, that the question could touch upon, but just thinking about the incentives to shift towards reuse, there are actually so many potential cost savings. Um, I know that uh, Joshua already noted, you know, if, if we did get the market to shift towards aluminum, for example, aluminum is infinitely recyclable, that can stay in the system, that can be cheaper if we decide to place focus, value, priority in that direction. Likewise, if we do that for reuse, and if we create these systems of reuse, where it's easy to repurpose shipping containers and shipping um, mesh wrap <laughs> and there are enough points along the chain for that to be used um then those companies are saving money because they're not continually investing and in purchasing new materials new products that require extraction processing transport whatever it is um if we're talking about plastic if we're talking about aluminum cardboard etc that still is um it still does require that flow if it's not being continually either recycled repurposed or directly reused and so i think that concept um can come to light if we're i don't know what kind of businesses necessarily are, are joining us today, but I know that Alejandra and I do work a lot with restaurants um, and others uh, in our network as well. And so just shouting out uh, to the group Rethink Disposable in California as well. They have an amazing uh, category, uh, sorry, library of case studies um, showing how restaurants of different sizes have made the shift towards reuse and how they've been able to save up to $600,000 annually in, in making that shift. And actually, some of the case studies are so specific, they look at specific items, whether it's forks or knives or bowls, um, and the payback period. And sometimes that, that payback period is within a matter of days or weeks. Um, and it's really fascinating to see that. And I know that many um, who are on this line and many businesses are looking for alternatives to single use plastics. Many are finding bioplastic or compostable plastic, commercially compostable plastic options that are already sold at a premium. So they're already 
paying more for these false solutions. Um, and uh, I say false solutions because there's not access to commercial composting uh, most places uh, in the world, not, nonetheless in this country. Um, and then just making sure that continues to be separated and actually making it to that treatment facility is really complicated. Reverse logistics required there too. So um, if you're investing already in a solution, may as well invest in one that will also save you money and also have more health benefits for your community as well. And sometimes the, we, we as businesses get used to that investment and we don't see it that that is the wrong investment that we should be making. Even a small business, where we do a lot of work with farmers and the farmer was telling me the bag of single use box, the box of single use bags that he uses used to be $20 and now it's $42. So we were having a conversation about you're investing money on trash. You're investing on waste. How can we make move this investment towards reusable and refillable alternatives? Because there's money there. So instead of putting that money in the trash, how are we going to make it move that investment to a system that is going to contribute to the circular economy? That's what we should be looking at. Thank you, Alejandra. Thanks all. Um, Alejandra, someone's asking if you can please talk more about restaurants offering to-go items that are hard to find, uh, non-plastics like condiment ramekins. Um, and this person says that they've seen edible containers used for cream cheese in Europe, which it sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, I think the person doing that this question has a little bit of experience because through our experience, that's the very last item that we get to change, the little plastic ramekins. And what we're doing is just buying reusable ones. And this even gives the, the business the opportunity to show a little bit what style of business they are. So let's say for little taquerias, we have these little cute um, clay ones. And let's say for Chinese restaurants, we have the Chinese style. So you know you can show your style through reuse. And it is more about dedicating time and effort to provide the technical assistance to these places that need it. Like Cassia said, rethink disposables, they're amazing. They invest in people, they invest in restaurants because they're telling them about something that is already there. It's an opportunity that they have because most of the time they already have the dishwashing a, a system that they need or they have a person helping with the dishwashing. They already own most of them, the materials that they need is how do we use this that we already have to stop uh, buying trash and, and start pushing for more reuse and refill. Thank you and so I find much. a lot of the a lot of the times it's actually going back to what we were doing 50 years ago. For example, I cook a lot. I cook probably 90% of the food I eat. And living in New York City, it's almost impossible right now to find places to go to to buy grains and beans in bulk. Yeah. And I went online and I am going to share this brand name because I love it. I found this company, it's a little blurred out, but it's called Timeless Natural Foods. And they ship all their beans, which are organic and or fair trade or both, uh, in paper bags. And they're actually sewn shut, which is the way all sacks of grains and beans and other food items used to be shipped. And it came in a box without any plastic packaging. And now, like, like Alejandra said, now that I found this brand, I won't just buy, I probably overbought because it's a 10 pound bag of beluga lentils, which takes <laughs> half of my kitchen. But I really it's really good for you here. though. <laughs> they're amazing. <laughs> but now that I know I had that experience with this brand and their ethos matches with my ethos, I can fill my entire kitchen with everything that they make. Awesome. And probably give 10 of my friends beluga lentils for the day. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Amazing. Oh, we're learning a lot tonight. Or you today. can you can put them in little jars and give them away for Christmas, Valentine's Day. Yep. You're gonna be a lentil guy. <laughs> lentils <from laughs> lentil <Valentine's>. guy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so Cassia, is there any update with the global plastics treaty or any other legislation that might be affecting businesses' ability to use alternatives to plastic? Yeah, absolutely. So the latest on the Global Plastics Treaty, and I believe uh, that 
Plastic Pollution Coalition did actually host a webinar on it. So I'll just give a shout out to you all <laughs> and for the for folks in the audience to, to take a look at that too, because I know some key players were part of that conversation. Um, but for those who are unfamiliar, the Global Plastics Treaty could potentially be the equivalent of a Paris Agreement for plastics, if, if folks are familiar with that as well, but essentially an international treaty that would be legally binding as it's currently drafted um, to tackle plastic production and disposal and to center impacts on communities as well. And, and so many in our, in our coalition have been able to get language that considers um, those impacts in, into, the, into the draft as well. So where we're at currently, um, this, was, this is hosted by the UN Environment Assembly or UN Environment Program, uh, UNEA, which is that UN Environment Assembly uh, 5.2, which is their latest convention that uh, took place in Nairobi in uh, earlier this spring, I believe it was March. And through that, there was a convening to, to discuss this global plastics treaty and, and to go forwards with a resolution. Any country could submit a resolution. Um, and ultimately, uh, Peru and Rwanda did submit a resolution. And it was most similar to that resolution that was passed. And that's a lot of you know legal specifics and jargon there. But essentially, we've made it past to the next step to progress this global plastics treaty. So we're now in a negotiation phase. Um, so we're actually, we've been, there have been different global convenings um, where civil society, where um, member states, where, you know, the, the, the governments of different countries and decision makers are actually gathering to have conversations about what should be included in this treaty. How do we ultimately decide what that treaty will look like? Um, and again, this is, this would be illegally binding internationally, but every country would have to create their own nationwide action plan to fulfill the targets of that treaty. And ultimately that would then be what's impacting companies impacting brands that are designing packaging impacting um, nationwide waste management infrastructure um, impacting and, and could lead to the development of other nationwide legislation so in the us we've have uh, proposed legislation called the break free from plastic pollution act i think also most likely discussed in, in this forum as well um, which includes many of these considerations that we want to see already that centers community that thinks about social and environmental impacts of the crisis that encourages us to move towards reuse towards refill um, and and to, to keep in mind the the growing pains in those transitions and, and to make sure we're keeping that um, front and, set and center. So I think um, all that to say that it's still very much in the negotiation phase. There's no specific targets that have been yet set, just the intention to create this global binding treaty, um, which could really catalyze uh, momentum in this space. And even just the fact that it's in the pipeline is enough for all of us here to go back to our communities, to our industries, to our sectors, and say that this is coming and will be impacting companies and businesses of all size. And it's better to be ahead of the curve than behind it um, and to already have started taking that action before any, any of that has been implemented. And beyond that, there are many plastic bans that exist around the world um, that are already um, offer, you know, offering um, the opportunity for to charge uh, fees or fines if you don't uh, comply. And you know, there's a wide range there. So some are focused on specific items like bags or the EU directive calls out 10 specific items um, that need to be phased out. And currently you can actually see the label saying this has plastic with a, a symbol of a turtle and it's bright red and blue. Um, so if you go to a coffee shop and you get a coffee cup that has plastic in it, um, it you're going to see that label. And so that calling out that that doesn't you know comply with with this with this directive and the, you know the shift that they want to be making. So we're, we're already starting to see that happen at the local scale, at the regional scale, in this case, at a more continental scale. Um, but this global treaty would just ensure that we're all speaking the same language as we define those targets and can move truly in the same direction, which is key. As we've mentioned, many of these supply chains are global. And this issue is global. So we do need to be tackling it together. Um, and this can hold us all accountable. So um, I hope that was I hope that was clear <laughs> at the end, but I uh, definitely encourage you all to, to to research and look more into it and um, an invitation also for everyone to reach out to your even to your local representatives. It ultimately get, can get up the chain, but just to encourage and, and to voice your support for this treaty, um, because we are at a stage where we, we do want the U.S. to continue to be involved for those that are in the U.S. We do want your country, wherever you are. I know this is a global audience to support and be involved in pushing this treaty forwards.
Um, the next phase in this journey, I was just pulling out my emails, um, will be an intergovernmental negotiating committee, INC. The first session uh, will be hosted in Uruguay, uh, November 28th to December 2nd. So that will be the next multi-stakeholder forum. Uh, and so, you know, gaining some momentum, reach out to your representatives before then so they're able to really represent you and your perspective and um yeah don't don't be afraid to be loud about that thanks for all that information great um so here's a question for joshua um the process which you now use for pangea products clearly took a lot to develop how would this translate into large-scale use what has to happen practically speaking i.e. what kinds of machines have to be replaced, what kinds of materials have to be purchased, et cetera, and what is the scale of the job? Um, actually, we're already set up for large scale production. And really the name of the game now is actually growing the brand so that we're hitting ma maximum volume so that we can continue to lower the prices of our products. If my goals are met within 10 years, Alpine should all be under $15 and making it more accessible. And the other thing about our products is everything is ultra concentrated. So a bottle of our Castile body wash will probably last two to three times longer than an average body wash. But yeah, a lot of this comes down to volume. And so we have to get our volumes up to keep our prices down. Thank you. Um, and so Cassie, you've worked with um, big companies as well, like Corona to reduce or eliminate plastic. So um, how can consumers encourage these large companies to shift if they can make the shift? Yeah, sorry, just trying to find the mute button. Um, yeah, there's so much. I, I know we were, we, we've already called out, I think Joshua mentioned, support companies that you know are doing the right thing, no matter what size they are, especially if they're small, to really vote with your dollars and to show what you, what you believe in, what you support. And for large companies, um, especially uh, if, if large companies are aligning with your values, certainly do support them and, and also reach out and, and say thank you or give positive reviews. I know we really encourage that when it comes to restaurants, hotels, companies that are more within service and lifestyle that do depend on, on positive reviews actually for their business and are highly responsive to all forms of feedback. So if you stay at a hotel that's drowning you in single-use plastic and you're frustrated by the experience, let them know. Let them know even at the concierge, you know, they may have no agency necessarily over that, but the more that they're hearing this this feedback and this response it will make it up the chain uh, and ultimately that's how that that's who they're they know these businesses know they're responsive to their consumers and to their um their community and network as well so depending on the kind of business there are different there are different ways to give that feedback um and if there is a company that you really you love uh for other reasons, but they're really not taking strides in their sustainability efforts or they're making commitments but you feel they're not holding living up to those commitments or those commitments could be more ambitious um, there are always ways to reach out or, or use i don't often recommend social media but i will say you can use twitter and reach out to them tag them call them out to, to, to do better and in general at oceanic global our approach is to be rather than shaming companies to support them because often as noted companies are made out of people and we can engage people we can change the hearts and minds of people and we can also give them tools to make it easier um, many times we, we also don't know if those conversations have been had behind closed doors, but businesses are struggling to find those alternatives or don't yet have the vision or the creativity or the access to see those solutions. And so I think just coming from that place of giving benefit of the doubt and just offering support is what's really needed. Um, so whatever ways you can do that, um, direct them to any of us here, Plastic Fusion Coalition, um, Plastic Free Future, Oceanic Global, Pangea Organics as an example. Um, and there are so many examples and resources out there actually Beyond Plastics earlier this week just released a new guide for, for restaurants in particular to go plastic free and list and highlighted and called out other resources, including ours that exist out there too. So the resources are now out there um, and the alternatives are now out there, even if um, sometimes it does take a little bit more digging depending where you are in the world or what context we're, in which we're speaking. So I think at this point, just putting that pressure on and, and showing as, that as a consumer and loyal, you know, brand uh, uh, fan that, that you're expecting them to do this and, and are there to support. I think that's really the tone that will be most supportive. Great, thanks. And I think uh, to leave it on a um, 
hopeful note and also hopefully maybe spark someone to make plastic free changes in their business. Are there any grants or funds available uh, for businesses who are seeking to make the switch? I wish. <laughs> if there's anybody out there that wants to create one, let me know. Yeah, I was going to say, I wish I had a better, better response. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think there's also ways to, we've encouraged businesses we've worked with as well to create um, creative funding solutions there as well. So I know we mentioned the pressure from consumers, but there also can be pressure from C-suite level executives. There can be pressure from investors, from trustees, uh, many of whom have uh, financial backing and, and, and access who could actually directly offer grants to those companies or businesses to, to make that shift, at least catalyze that shift at the beginning to cover that those transition costs. As we mentioned, there's a payback period for reuse in particular and other solutions. So if those initial costs can be fronted. Um, so I think just looking through the ecosystem of partners who are invested and seeing who who is pushing pushing that shift. Um, Jen's putting in BYO bottle in the in the chat um, as well. Thank you. Um, Joshua, what's your advice for other beauty brands looking to change their packaging? Some words of wisdom. Words of wisdom is start now. <laughs> you know, and don't and don't cut corners because it's kind of like when the organic beauty industry started, there was a ton of brands racing to be organic but making really poor quality product. And that doesn't help the movement. We need to show people that we can make extremely high quality product that out delivers customers' expectations so that they know that by making that switch, they're not losing what they wanted in their brand and in their products and their performance. And of course, like things like using the pump again, that's gonna take some learning and I've been on chat threads with people who are upset that they don't get a new pump with every bottle because they didn't actually understand why we were doing it. And once you explain it to them, they then become advocates. And I think it's really important to be a steward for that fringe. And also, you know, for me as a brand owner, I feel like the future is here and it's just not evenly distributed. And our job as a brand owner is to make sure that our end goal is to, to evenly distribute these options for a brighter future. Thank you. Um, I have a question here for Cassia. Is there an online database that can be searched for product and or location to find plastic free alternatives? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and also just to follow up on the funding question, I just wanted to confirm it was still going, um, but there's this group called Plastic Free Restaurants that does offer subsidy for restaurants. And it seems also schools that are looking to eliminate plastics or make that transition. So um, just, uh, I, yeah, I think I put that in the host chat, um, but that that is out there too. And I think there's something also uh, that, Diana referenced the reusable network. So it, it perhaps it's growing and it's out there. So, so search for it if you are looking for those, those grants and those funding opportunities and also see what's available in your region locally um, as well. And there has been history too of um, uh, local government supporting reuse systems as well or having bids to, to support the, the funding of establishing reuse systems if it comes to to-go containers or um, reusable cup systems um, and often that's city by city. So, so take a look at what your city is doing as well. Um, and regarding the actual vendors or the solution providers, so uh, through the Blue Standard, we have a, something that we call the Blue List. We're working on making that public. It's not yet um, public fully. Uh, it's, it's quite messy in the way we've got it organized at the moment, um, but it's it's growing in all directions because there are so many new solutions that we all keep learning about, and it's so amazing. Um, I would also point towards um, Plastic Pollution Coalition's membership. There are many solution pro providers within the membership, so I believe that is searchable at the PPC team. Speak to that. Um, but yes, uh, hopefully our blue list will become public soon. Uh, and what we do in the meantime is support 
I mentioned we empower consultants to engage businesses within their region. So we do, and that's a free training. Um, and so we do share localized lists with consultants and actually co-create those lists as we work with um, local experts um, in a different region or, or area to, to help find those alternatives and, and to vet those together collectively based on regional considerations, waste management, material sourcing, et cetera. Um, so uh, yeah, so so perhaps more more to come, um, but uh, yeah, excited to share that and reach out. Please do reach out if you're interested in being a consultant or starting to learn a more more get to be involved as boots on the ground and learn more about what's going on in your region. Thank you, Cassia, and also Joshua and Alejandra. Um, we're going to wrap up the Q and A now. Are there any final comments um, from our panelists tonight? We're all good. We had a lot of questions. So thanks thanks so much to our audience for populating the Q&A um, and for sharing tonight and our panelists once again for dedicating their time and expertise to sharing all this information with our global audience. So we have an upcoming webinar um, in August. Please take a look for our upcoming webinar titled, Will Mushrooms and Seaweed Help Replace Single-Use Plastics? Featuring innovative companies that are replacing single-use plastic items with products made from seaweed and mushrooms. Don't miss out. And if you have not already, we invite you to join our global coalition. It is free to join as an individual, business, or nonprofit. And please connect with us on social media to learn more. Um, we'll also be sending out a survey link and appreciate your feedback to help us improve. Thanks again to everyone for joining us. And thanks also to our Plastic Pollution Coalition member groups and partners who shared this webinar with their communities and networks far and wide. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in August. Good night. <laughs>